lecturer, board member, book author, and he's a renowned expert when it comes to the impact of digital media and technology on people, societies, businesses, and in specific, future of work. Welcome, please, with a warm applause, Dr. Sarah Genner. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for having me on stage here. I'm happy to have a conversation and a talk to you about the future of work. It will be in Swinglish, Swiss English. <laughs> I was born and raised in the city of Zurich. I spent some time abroad, so I spoke some English, but it's been a while, so it's hard. But I'm going to try to find every bit of English in my memory. <laughs> Um, I also have a digital home that is on the Cocos Islands. As you can see now, my company is called um, mylastnamegenerate.cc. I've never been there, though, but I might want to go there someday. Christine said I recently wrote a book that's called ABC Digital, and I explain a lot of topics about digital transformation. Topics like the metaverse, artificial intelligence, of course, algorithmic decision-making, blockchain, new work, robots, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so on. And you might think I'm going to talk about the future of work that might look like this. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you if you think this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about AI-powered corporate reporting, even though you might wish that AI might do the job for you someday, right? <laughs> that would be nice. So maybe the future of work is not going to look like this, even though if you ask generative AI <laughs> to create a picture of the future of work um, in corporate reporting and AI-based corporate reporting, this is what AI thinks it's going to look like. I don't know if, it's, if that's a future that you would be looking forward to. So I'm not going to talk about these topics and paint a picture of that kind of the future of work. I brought five chapters on the future of work that I think are relevant to talk about when it comes to the future of work. And the first one is that I claim AI will not kill jobs. Even though you might read it in the newspapers almost every single day, especially since ChatGPT has conquered the world, it seems, there are a lot of headlines claiming that a lot of jobs will not be needed anymore. You can read in the reporting times that a former boss of mine um, created also the Center for Corporate Reporting. 15 years ago, I had a background in corporate reporting. <laughs> Not anymore, though, but I'm glad a lot of people still do. So in the reporting times, you can find articles like how AI images will revolutionize branding and corporate reporting. I don't know if it really does, in your opinion. I don't really like the generated pictures. It's fascinating, but... I hope you will use good photographers in the future as well, human photographers. <laughs> EY tells you how to make the most of AI in corporate reporting. Just point your finger. <laughs> Apparently. We don't know if that's true. But they might know more about this than I do. But what I can tell you is that I have a huge collection of magazines and newspaper articles claiming that machines will steal jobs in the future. And the collection goes back many decades. You can see robots being uh, endangering humans and their jobs. And it, goes, it comes back to the present, where they still think that humans are here mostly to actually be um, the surveyors um, this, in the surveillance of machines. If you're really interested in the topic, this is, 
I think, the best article that has been written about the topic of the history and future of workplace automation. It's by uh, an MIT specialist that specializes in the history of workplace automation. And it goes back to the, the first industrial revolution 200 years ago. This is when people already feared that the jobs will be taken by machines. And he asks the question, why are there still so many jobs if we feared 200 years up to now that we will not have jobs? I think the real issue that we have is the war for talents. That's what we should be talking about. How to attract talents. Because we seem to have more jobs than people willing to do the jobs. It's not about AI stealing the jobs, really, is it? So in Switzerland, we have skills shortage. But in a lot of, in a lot of other countries, we have more, even more skills shortage. We have projections that in China it will be terrible, the skills shortage in the US, but even in Switzerland, this is the topic that we have to talk about. And it's not only um, people in restaurants, in information technologies, it's in, in, in a lot of other fields as well. We have a major demographic shift happening. We have a lot of baby boomers that will not be working anymore. They will be retired soon, and we don't have enough people to actually fill, fill in for them. So that's why we are in the midst of a war for talents. Some even call it the new war for talents, which is why I think the future of work is about talent attraction. How can companies or organizations attract good talents? for their workforce. Some say, especially in the new work movement, they say it's all about purpose. You need to, be ha you need to have a purpose-driven company. You need to have purpose. I think that's maybe a little utopian sometimes. Companies are here to make money, of course, to pay for salaries and other stuff. Want to make profit. Some have a higher purpose, I think, especially this book by Frédéric Laloux called Reinventing Organizations contains this circle that is a little utopian, but interesting to look at. They have a few organizations like Patagonia that have a really a higher purpose, distributed decision making. Some people think that's how all companies should look like. I'm not sure this will work. It might be an inspiration. Some say, we have a mental health crisis, health crisis in general, also in the workplace. So should companies attract talents by providing fruit <laughs> every day or a free gym? That's what a lot of them do, and it's probably not bad. Some say, the work-life balance and mental health would be much better if we didn't have constant cyber connectivity, if we were not hyper-connected to the workplace at all times through our smartphones and other devices. Australia decided that their workers should have a right to disconnect. They think it would be better to have real off-work hours and not just off-work hours spending spent on the smartphone and this is quite an old topic in in germany volkswagen was made headlines in um, about 15 years ago when they said okay um, the bosses will get um, blackberries but we're going to switch off the email servers after um, at night and on the weekends but if you ask these companies that try to do this it didn't really work. People started to find workarounds. They used their private emails to actually have the benefits of it all. Because some people have kids, they need to pick them up. Also, they want to be able to work at night and be able to pick up the kids anyway. So this could be not very practical. In Switzerland, we still have a law that says you can't work for 11 hours at night. You should have a break. This is our law and our right to disconnect, but nobody knows about it. 
nobody really cares, do we? <laughs> so if you care about digital balance and digital connectivity, I made two um, checklists. One is for individuals, digital balance, and, um, and, it's, um, and the other one is for companies, a checklist about how to handle constant connectivity. And you can download them, but they're in German, I'm afraid. <laughs> Some say to attract the best talents, you need to have Instagrammable office spaces <laughs> so that the young people are willing to come back to the office. But office spaces that look like this, they're maybe not so comfortable for our backs, after all. <laughs> they may look good, but some of the chairs are not so good for working for hours. Some say companies may have to provide flats, especially in Zurich, because we don't have enough living space for all the work workers that we're looking for. They say we don't have the ideal formula according to a new ETH study. We should have much more flats and rentable space for people who want to work in our city. So it might be an interesting thing to think, to to think about for companies to actually provide also living space for their workers to attract talents, maybe. I think the bottom line is it comes down to leadership and trust. That's what research has found to be the most important factor, why people want to work in certain places or why they quit their jobs, because there's not enough trust. A study by Qualtrics shows that this is the major motivation for employees. It's trusting their own bosses, trusting their own leadership, trust in the team and trust of managers in their employees, if they feel they're trusted. That's the bottom line, why people are motivated to really work. Of course, sometimes the salary is also relevant <laughs> and other stuff, but this is really why people want to work in those places. This uh, has caught a lot of attention recently in um, the new work um, movement to talk about psychological safety. A company culture that allows for psychological safety, that allows that people comfortably admit mistakes, learn from failure, and still everyone wants to share ideas openly. This is what makes an innovative team and learning culture. This is also based on a uh, very famous study called Google's project Aristotle. They wanted to find out what are the most effective teams within Google. What, why are they more effective than other teams? A lot of people thought that it's mainly about diversity. You need to have diverse teams to be most effective. But what they found is that those teams that have the highest score in psychological safety. Those were by far the most effective teams. So if you want to be, uh, you want your employees to be able to speak up if they think where you're going as a team is wrong, even though they're not the boss. And that's a really hard environment to foster. It's all about trust and the learning culture and admitting mistakes and knowing that even if you're the boss, you may not be the one knowing everything um, and you should be able to rely on your employees to tell you what's best. Chapter four, hybrid work is the new normal. Of course, you know, <laughs> a lot of things changed um, after the pandemic, hybrid work means has two meanings, actually. One of them is coming to office on some days and remaining at home or re working remotely, for example, from uh, a co-working space. Um, so this is um, hybrid work in one sense, and you have hybrid meetings. 
where everybody gets to ask, can you hear me? Oh, we can't hear you, you know, these kinds of meetings. <laughs> So the pandemic really changed things. I think that was one of the most, um, of the, uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a member of the board of directors. I'm on three boards these days, and at the end of the pandemic, in one of the companies I'm on the board on, we have a lot of uh, software developers. And those guys were actually super happy to stay at home. They never wanted to come back to the office anymore. And for us on the board to have to tell the C-level executives, especially the CTO, that's a super important person in the company, to come back to the office because we need this organizational culture. We want people to know each other, to trust each other, to see each other, to meet at the coffee machine and talk about stuff that is maybe not in a formal meeting. That was a really hard moment to tell them you have to come to the office at least two days a week. And we're even going to tell you which days, because otherwise two days will not be enough for everybody to meet once a week, at least once a week. It's really hard. So you want to keep the best talents, but then you have to tell them things that they don't want to hear. So that's really the hardest balance I think that a lot of leaders face these days. Another thing that I think is underestimated is cybersecurity in remote work settings. A lot of people work with, with a bring your own device strategy in their companies. So the, the IT department doesn't have all the cybersecurity settings <laughs> for those uh, devices. And I think that's a really important topic for companies to think about. Are we sure that people working from home and remotely actually handle the data and the communication in a safe way? Are we actually going back to the future by calling back people who wanted to work remotely and actually enjoyed it? This guy was one of the first to say, um, you have to come back to the office full-time, otherwise you're fired. <coughs> we may not be very surprised <laughs> that <he's laughs> he, he was the one to say this, but he's not the only one. With Amazon, we saw the same thing, and more recently, in the region of Zurich, we saw Sulze, who did the same thing. And part of me understands, and part of me is, is not sure if they're going to be able to keep their best talents. So this balance is really what it's all about, I think. To find a good balance in hybrid work, remote work, flex desk, that's another very emotional topic. A lot of companies are taking away their, the, their fixed um, office space. So nobody has their own space when they go go to the office anymore. It's a very emotional topic. A lot of people think that's a very good thing. That's how the future of work is. But I think if you want to keep your best talents, you should also find a hybrid model there and give people the desk that they want if they say that's what makes them most effective. It's a very delicate topic. You may know this. <laughs> yeah. Lifelong learning culture, very important to foster and the corporate culture is also fueled by the trust that we need. Chapter five, the future work is about hybrid balance, how to balance all this flexibility that is so positive on the one side and it's complicated on the other side, as I said. I love this quote about the future, by the way. <laughs> the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. This is by a famous science fiction author named William Gibson. And I think a lot of companies are actually already where other companies should be in the future. So the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Some companies are, ha already have found the balance 
between fostering trust and corporate identity and give people the flexibility to work from home or work remotely. But this is really the delicate balance that every company has to find on their own. There is no recipe or one size fits all. It depends on the company, on the, on the culture and the people that work there. And you have to find your own balance. It's hard. I think the goal when it comes to new work and employer branding, which might be an in interesting topic for people in corporate reporting, corporate communications, I think the goal is to create the workplace that attracts the best talents, but also to keep the best talents. That's not always the same thing, <laughs> but you need to do both. Some think we need a major AI strategy these days <laughs> for the company to be innovative, but I think no digital tool no fancy office can beat a motivated team. It's nice to invest in AI tools and other fancy technical stuff, but it also, it's probably even nicer to invest in leadership and in people who are willing to learn and to actually make a difference for a motivated team culture. And they will bring back the, the tools, also the technological tools, that will enhance your own business. Because it's, every business is different and not every digital tool is good for, this, uh, for every business. So if you have really dedicated employees and you give them time to learn, to go maybe um, um, and do some further education, they will come back and bring it in. If you still need some new work goals, Here's a list that I made, and I'm sure you will be able to get the slides if you're really interested in where you can start. Because, as I said, for every company, it's a different thing where to start. And the low-hanging fruits are not the same in every company. Some need, actually, nicer office spaces <laughs> for people to want to work there. But for some, it's really about improving the leadership quality and the culture. And that's harder to do than finding nice sofas. So the bottom line, I think when it comes to the future of work, we have three major drivers. We have digital transformation that is much more than just the AI revolution. We have the post-pandemic hybrid work culture, and we have the war for talents, which is why I think employer branding matters. You need to know why you're a good employer and have people managing your employer brand. And as I kept saying in my talk, fostering trust and learning is key. And last but not least, some things never change. How to, do work, how to work better was probably the same in the past, in the present, and in the future. And I don't know if you know this piece of art by two Zurich-based artists named Fischli Weiss. They put this list up on a, a wall of an office building close to the airport. You might have seen it from the train going by. And they say that they got the inspiration from a company in the factory, actually, in Thailand. So they were inspired. Maybe they stole it. I don't know. They put it up there and they say, the people working in this building were not thrilled to see to have this up there, even though they thought it was an interesting list. The people in New York City, apparently, where they put it up as well, were much more thrilled to see it. And two years ago, I found the same list in Tirana, next to an ice cream stand, <laughs> which is also good sometimes, um, to have an ice cream with your colleagues and maybe think about all these things on how to work better. Do one thing at a time, know the problem, admit mistakes, say it simple, be calm and smile. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Come a bit to the center. Uh, do you have questions?
You would like to ask, Sarah, here. So if you could have your hand held up so that Except, do we have two microphones? We have two microphones, right? So you can give me another one and then I'm in the front so I could be faster. Right. <laughs> I'll kick off. Um, Thank you. So you said uh, hmm? there yeah. are companies uh, that get it right, <laughs> um, but also that it depends uh, on their particular situation. Is there one or two case studies you can explain companies that got it right and why they got it right? Huh, that's a really good question. Or just one case study, if it's a big <laughs> one. <laughs> um, honestly, um, I think the one company I'm on the board on, which is not the one I mentioned the, before, they got it right, but it's a small SME, a Swiss SME, or a small, medium company, which is actually the case for 99% of the Swiss companies. But I know... You guys are from companies that are mostly not SMEs because you're listed, um, listed companies, which are usually bigger companies, and I think it's much harder to handle those cases than SMEs. SMEs, um, it's easy because you have people, they're small, and you know those people. So it's easier to find a balance um, between... Um, and uh, Because you know how these people work, you know what they need to actually be, um, to have a, a good performance and be effective, and you talk to each other. And in big companies, that's much, much harder. So I see big companies like banks, Swiss banks, um, they have to find a solution about working from home for everybody. And it just doesn't work, because every team is different, and you have people who need to be um, at work every day, and some people who don't really have to come into the office, and some teams. So you have to find team-based solutions. These are. Um, this is my my major tip: find team-based solutions. How to work together. Um, sometimes with teams, uh, we create hybrid work cartas, which is some kind of a manifesto on a team basis, where you have um, where you write. When do we meet every week? Um, when do we meet in person? And what are our communi uh, communication channels to collaborate? Because a lot of teams have way too many communication channels, which is why it makes it so hard to actually um, break out of this always-on cycle of constant digital connectivity. And so I think that's what every team should do, especially in big companies. And otherwise, find a good boss in, his, in, a, in, a, in an SME and someone who really likes people, talks to people, and finds a way to lead everyone a little differently so they can keep motivated. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, Sarah, just on my way, um, what is the real reason for companies like Sulzer, Amazon and so on to get the people back, because I mean, if you if you say I want them to meet at the coffee machine, you know they can have three days, let's say, to meet at the coffee machine, and but they they, they want to have them back, one hundred percent. Why? Is it a lack of trust? What are they doing when they're at home, or what is it? I think it might be, and also these conversations are really hard to have. What I just su su suggested, the hybrid work carta or the team mm -hmm. manifesto. This is really hard work. You have to listen to everybody. You have to find, you have to compromise and you have to talk to people. Maybe you will not find a solution um, very quickly. And these are hard conversations to have. I think it's much easier to, to say, we're, we're just going to do it the way we've always done it. You need to have a special reason to work from home. And otherwise, we just want people back. Okay. I think it's easier. And it might be cybersecurity reasons in yeah. some, some instances. But... You might have to ask them. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. Your question, yeah, please. So I have a, a philosophical question about AI and the future of work. I hope that's okay. Of um, course. So, so, so AI is obviously still very young, mm -hmm. um, and yet we're very close to the point where AI agents will have access to the sum total of human knowledge. So my, my question is whether you see a scenario, whether you see risk that effectively the knowledge economy could go to zero 
uh, and that the future of work there becomes then becomes more about us performing sort of manual real world tasks as opposed to information management which is what we're mostly engaged with at the moment hmm. that's a really good question but also a very hard question isn't it <laughs> um i don't think that ai is as new as everyone's pretending <laughs> Because what we're really talking about right now is generative AI. And that's the new thing that has impressed us with ChatGPT, Claude, and all the other tools. But we've had AI in robotics for, for many years. We've had AI-based um, software, like e even Google Maps is AI-based, but nobody talks about it. Shazam is AI-based. A lot of software has AI. Um, fueled, but um, you mentioned that soon AI will access every knowledge on the planet. <laughs> and I think it already does. And the problem is that there's not much more. We don't, we don't create enough for it to, um, to even become smarter. I think we're at a point where it doesn't get that much smarter than it is these days. To be honest, I'm not very worried. <laughs> I think we still need humans and their brains, their intelligence, plus their intuition, their human intuition, and the combination will still be needed. And as I said, we should, we should worry about the war for talents and not about AI that will steal the most interesting jobs, I think. <laughs> so I think last question. Yes. Do you have any studies that would compare over time, you know, what's the impact actually of the so-called best talent versus the culture? Um, does, it, does it pay off really to, uh, you know, to struggle to attract best talent versus to struggle to have the best culture? Because I'm, I'm mentioning this question because in fact, you know, I think what in the discussion, this hybrid work and why people sometimes call people back to the office, what is uh, often uh, emphasized is this lack of trust, but on the other hand, maybe they just prioritize the culture. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't think you can actually um, separate them from each other, because I think you need a good culture to attract good talents. Good talents leave if you don't have a good culture. So um, I think it's both. You need good people to create a culture of trust, and that's the one of the one of the hardest things to do. If people call me, can can you help us improve the culture? I tell them, ask somebody else. People are more experienced in that. I know this is so hard. It it can take years to actually improve the 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 corporate culture. It's not just done a few workshops and then a few months and then you will have a good culture to attract the best talents. <laughs> It can take years, and we should acknowledge that. And you need a lot of skills to improve the culture, to attract and keep the best talents, I think. May, may I be the party crasher at the end of this discussion? Because you were not really talking about money. And what I observe, especially with young generation, my kids are 28, 29, hmm? so I know not the very young, but, but this generation, which is now somehow taking over, you know. I think the young generation, they are used that money is around somehow, huh, many of them. So they do not pay that much attention. As soon as they have to make their own living, it changes. So uh, on your list, you showed us, you know, uh, I think you should add, from my perspective, yes, psychological uh, safety, yes, purpose, yes, culture, and pay better than your competitor. Yes. Because I think we just sometimes miss a bit. It's like, ah, uh, it's a bit a taboo, you mm -hmm. know. But what I see is as soon as they make their living, it's like, what, you earn that much in that company? Do you have like jobs there and mm -hmm. so on? Money, on my opinion, sorry, <laughs> matters more than we sometimes think in that discussion. I agree, thank you. Also, the list is 10 points. Mm -hmm. So mean, we have an 11. And one of the 10 points, but it's mostly at the bottom, is also salary. Okay, good. Yeah. So I agree. It matters. Maybe we put them 
a bit more uh, about we can't it's just <laughs> it's just you know life is expensive I they find out quickly <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> sarah kenna thank you very much